Chapter 50 You are now listening to The Chapter of the Architect with DJ Architect. My peoples in the place to be, what's going on? This is your homeboy, DJ Architect. I want to welcome you guys to another chapter of The Architect. With your man, of course, me. Listen, I got a special guest on the phone. This individual I hold in high, high regard. This individual, believe it or not, was one of the trainers that equipped me with the details the knowledge of weaponry, the knowledge of being a platoon, infantryman, squad leader, and machine gunner. This gentleman is, he's a killer, a crazy individual, and I hold him in the utmost respect. This is Gunnery Sergeant Manny Mo Molina. Manny, how you doing, my brother? I'm doing pretty good. Listen, I know we kind of had a little bit of miscommunication. You were supposed to be here in the studio, but nonetheless, I got you on the phone. Any way I can get you on the podcast uh, is a successful way of doing things, and here you are. Let's go ahead and let's talk about, before we jump into the, the nitty-gritty, you, I've known you for many years, my friend, many years. Uh, we came back from Iraq, you and I, we became roommates uh, we had a little apartment out in Vista, California, uh, Buena Vista Apartments, and we were together for a while in Iraq and there in that apartment. Let's get into the uh, let's get into the nitty gritty, man. Of of what made you join the Marine Corps, brother? Honestly, um, you know, I, I I didn't think of anything that I wanted to do outside of being you know, a, a Marine. Um, part of it was uh, I wanted to get away from uh, some of the bad influences in in, uh, in your young adolescent life, you know what I mean? Hmm. And, um, well, hell, um, I also wanted to um, earn that uniform so that I can be uh, that ladies' man, you know what I mean? <laughs> Yes, sir. You you grew up in California, correct? Yes. Where in California? I grew up in North Hollywood, California. So, uh, yes, um, I am a Hollywood Marine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a Paris Island Marine. I know there's a lot of debates. A lot of individuals listen to the podcast probably know what don't know what the debate is. But nonetheless, we're we're not going to get into it this evening. But uh, tell us about your life growing up in uh, Hollywood, California, man. Uh, well, um, you know, just the basic stuff, you know, going to school and stuff like that. Um, however, you know, in the area that I live, yeah, we did have, um, you know, gang members and stuff like that. So uh, one of the um, predominant gangs there was uh ms ms13 hmm. you know not, not that you know they're just there you know i was just going to school and doing my thing and you know but you nonetheless you can you, you kind of feel that tension or that, that little bit of friction you know with um, um the activity that goes on right I do understand what you're talking about. Hey, Manny, by any chance, do you do you have any pets? Do you have any dogs? Any cats? I used to. What do you, you used to? Uh-huh. What did you have? I had a, a pit bull. Okay. It was a um, um, razor edge mixed with a gaudy uh, bloodline. Okay. Uh, so she kind of... Um, she kind of looked like um, Tiger Stripe, you know? Nice. Like, that type of coat, you know, like an orange coat with a little bit of stripes on it. Yeah. Yeah. The reason why I'm jumping off topic, man, was um, your dog. Uh, why don't you have your dog now? Did your dog pass away or did you uh, had to move and give the dog away? What happened? 
I had to um, let her go. Mm. She was too jealous around uh, people, you know, so she kind of not behave. Yeah, I understand, man. Listen, or she not that people. Right. I totally understand. The reason why I'm bringing that up is obviously, you know, my wife, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Gunnery Sergeant Manny Moe, him and I being so close, so tight, I would call him to this day. I call him my son. And he was around the time where, you know, actually the evening that I met my wife, uh, him along with uh, at the time, Sergeant Romerdred. Uh, were goading me, uh, trying to get me to come out to hang out this Friday evening, and I didn't want to go that particular evening because of these guys making me go. I ended up meeting my wife, so my wife knows. Acapulco's. Yes, so Manny Mo knows my wife, and um, you know, out of out of out of uh, you know the, the the friendship, we we call him our son. You know. <laughs> Uh, no disrespect intended is just a, a loving moniker. So <clears throat> my wife and I, we have two basset hounds, uh, a girl that we got when she was a puppy and then uh, a boy basset hound that we ended up rescuing when he was about six, seven months old. So they're very close in age. And just last Wednesday, we unfortunately had to take him to the eye vet and he had to get this injection and in his last good eye visual eye that he could see out of because of the glaucoma. So the way glaucoma works, they get this pressure in their, in their head. And if the pressure becomes too immense, the eyeball pops out. And I noticed uh, one day or two days prior to this, that he was walking into the walls. Uh, long story short, last Wednesday, I had to take him back. Uh, to the same doctor and I knew what the outcome was going to be. And, uh, you know, we, we had went to go see her on Monday. She gave us all the medication for the dog. I was hoping Wednesday that his eye pressure would be low, but nonetheless, uh, they took the pressure on his, uh, good eye and it was extremely high. And I'm looking at this doctor and she's looking at me and I, I could see, that it's probably going to be the same procedure where they're going to freeze his good eye uh, to relieve the the pressure. But with doing that, uh, he's going to go completely permanently blind. And I said to her, Doc, what other options do we have to save his vision? Money not being an option. I mean, don't worry about the money. I want to save this guy's last good eye. And she said, unfortunately, because the pressure is so high, uh, we have to do the same uh, procedure and he's going to become permanently blind. And right there, I, I, my soul shattered and I had to call my wife and we agreed. And, uh, you know, she says, I'll, we'll give you a call in about four or five hours for you to come pick him up. And on the way home, bro, I'm a grown man, you know, to combat tours to Iraq and on the way uh, home, I left them there with a, the, with the doctor, man, for her to do the procedure knowing that my dog was about to be completely blind and I break down, man. Listen, it, 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 there's nothing more sad than uh, knowing your dog is about to be blind. Uh, the only thing more detrimental, I would say, is when you have to go to the doctor to euthanize your dog because of old age or whatever have you, man. But it's crippling, man, and it's crippling. And and uh, I want to thank all the friends that I reached out to and asked, you know, hey, man, tips and recommendations. Have you ever had a situation like this? How'd you get through it? But it's it's heartbreaking, man. It it really is heartbreaking, and 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 you know my dog's name is Droopy, Droopy Dog, the Basset Hound, and uh, I just I just wanted uh, to let individuals know, man, if they're ever in that situation where your dog is is going blind or he's up in age, what I'm finding out is they're pretty resilient. You know, us as human beings, we take it a lot harder than they do. Uh, but I just wanted to give my dog Droopy Dog a big shout out, man, and. Uh, and tell people, man, that if your dog is is going blind, just give it some time. They'll figure 
uh, their way around the house. Just don't move furniture around left or right. Just keep it where it is and, and they're going to be okay. But I didn't mean to segue off, uh, Manny Mo. I just had a, I had to put that statement out, man. I, but, you know, my wife and I took it pretty, and it's still to this day, we're still. How old is the dog now? He's only seven years old, man. He's only seven years old. Okay. Yeah, but the glaucoma, man, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, especially when you don't have any kids and, and your dogs are your children, man. It's funny, too, man, because I remember uh, uh, my a good friend of mine, my old coworker, uh, Donnie Edwards, you know, he would uh, say, yeah, man, my dogs are my family. And at the time, I didn't have any dogs. And I was like, I used to say to him, you know, you're just like, man, you're soft. But because of him, I, I, you know, I got my first dogs, and uh, believe me, man, they make your life so much, uh, much more rich. Uh, it's unconditional. Actually, I, I, had, love. I also had a bulldog. Her name was Kona, and mm. uh, you know what? Them bulldogs, they're 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 something else, man. You definitely need to take care of them. You know, they have a lot of problems too. They have a lot of breathing problems, right? Because of their short snout nose, correct? Yeah. Breathing is one of them, um, but also the wrinkles. You know, they they get um uh, uh, like uh, what they call them. Um, they get jagged. You mm. know, so they they yeah. So they uh, you know from their skin rubbing on those uh, on its own wrinkles, and then eventually you know it's so shaved that um uh it starts coming out. Oh no way! Yeah, and and uh, yeah, if you if if you don't like take care of it. Then it, it just you know yeah it can, um, they can they can become infected yeah not only that but it, it kind of smells a little bit you know All right so you have to keep that area clean yeah absolutely I understand back to you brother I just want to give a big shout out to my to my son Drooby Dog man you know he going through his blind stages. Uh, but you know, I gotta be grateful, man. My wife and I have to be grateful. He's still alive and we're going to take care of that little basset hound, uh, to the best of our ability until the day comes. So here you are a young man living in North Hollywood, having the, the gang life surrounding you, you know, you have to find some kind of escape to get out of this situation. Manny Mo, Gunnery Sergeant Molino. Why the Marine Corps? Why not any other branch? Honestly, you know what I was shooting for, like being a you know a special forces sniper, recon, something like that. You know, because mm. obviously you know, we all see the commercials and everything like that, and you know it, it definitely looks like um, adventurous and 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 all of that um, until you actually get into it and then you're like oh shit you know um in my case you know i'm not i was shit i I went in not knowing how to swim yeah but you know know, but surely the army has delta force green berets navy has uh navy seals you know uh, air force has the pjs why why the marine corps because the marine corps stood out more to me how so not to mention how so? Not to mention, um, well, you have the, the the uniform. I remember just talking to the recruiters because they were more proactive in my school and stuff like that. Right. I guess I, I saw myself more of a Marine than in any other branch. Hmm. Now, you know, there's, there's some people out there for, um, you know, my, my brother, for example, you know, he joined the Navy, right? but because of, um, difficulties in the promotion with his particular MOS, you know, he transferred to the army. Can so I you... think in, in a lot of cases, that's what happens. You know, um, you end up going into a different branch because you reached your limit or, or whatnot, you know, or, or you pursuing something different. Can you break down the acronym MOS to the individuals who are listening to the podcast who don't know uh, what MOS means? MOS is military occupational service. Right. So that pretty much the job description for um you know what it is that um one wants to do 
uh, while serving. Correct. So as you're going to the Marine Corps recruiter, what did you say to him that you wanted your MOS to be, or or did he coach you along to a particular well, military, military yeah. occupational skill? What did he say to you? It was like this. I was lauded to be a motor team um, crewman, or I don't, I don't know what the MOS number is for it, You because know, every, every MOS has a, a four-digit number that designates you know, the occupation. Uh, well, at the last minute, I decided, you know what? A uh, motor key guy is not a, a recon or he's not doing all this other crazy shit, you know? So let me see if I can swap that out. What, what can you explain to the listeners what motor T would specifically be? Motor transport is, uh, um, um, the military occupation that deals with vehicles, um, mechanics, uh, the logistics to support in bringing in the parts and, um, you know, being able to repair all those vehicles, towing the vehicles with the crane. So everything that, that, that goes along with the uh, vehicles. Let's, let's pause real quick uh, because I want everyone to know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, my military occupational skill, when I, uh, was coming into the Marine Corps was supposed to be combat engineer. When I got out of boot camp and I went to what's called MCT, Marine Corps Combat Training, and once I graduated that, the boat spaces, meaning the spaces to be filled for that class, were were uh, they were filled. They were all occupied, and the available spaces for the next class similar in my um, IQ GPA level for that type of uh, MOS was 3521, which is diesel mechanic, which falls under the tree of motor transport. And the reason why I say that is because there's a, there's a tie, there's a link that's going to happen here within the story of myself and Gunnery Sergeant Molina, where the Marine Corps says every Marine is a rifleman. Doesn't matter what your military occupational skill is. You can be administration. You could be doing pay. You can be a, uh, a cook flipping pancakes and making eggs. Uh, you can be logistics, being in charge of transporting muni uh, munitions and supply uh, from the beach on uh, or the ocean onto the beach, it doesn't matter. Uh, but when the Marine Corps needs you to become uh, an infantry Marine, they're going to make that happen. And that is what happened with me. And then we'll get into that story. Uh, and I was blessed to have the experience of gunnery sergeant at the time, Sergeant Molina, and at the time I was a sergeant. But uh, I, I think it was, it's very important for me to explain doesn't matter what MOS you go into gentlemen or, or ladies whoever's listening to the podcast when the United States is at war the Marine Corps will put you in necessary slots and then you find yourself like I did trading my toolbox for an M16 AT4 rocket launcher and grenades so let's get back to where we left off gunnery sergeant you're there at the recruiter. Yeah. You're there at the recruiter, and so what happens? Yeah, so I'm there at Mets, and by the way, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to share this with you guys. Um, yeah, so we're there, you know, and, and I'm a 17-year-old kid, scared. I'm scared, you know, because I'm like, oh, shit, I don't know what the hell I'm getting in, into, you know. In, in other countries, there's a belief the that Marines have to kill a, a member of their family to, to join. Mm, yeah. You know? that, that hardcore, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, well, here I am. And, um, obviously, you know, the recruiters pull the strings, you know, the magical strings and, and they get me what I wanted, which was, uh, you know, I wanted, I wanted to be an infantryman and then move up from there to, uh, do all the other Yo. good stuff. 
Manny Mo, you know that wasn't that difficult, right? <laughs> to, right. It wasn't that, ladies and gentlemen, the reason why I'm saying that is because if you go into the Marine Corps, open contract, that means uh, you didn't tell the recruiter what specific MOS or let's say you you could have been a very intelligent person and you scored high. You could have gone, you could have become a linguistics officer. You could have had a degree, but if you go into the Marine Corps with open contract, you're probably going to go infantry. Uh, that's why I was making and referring that joke to Gunnery Sergeant Molina, my man, because it wasn't that difficult for the recruiter to be like, all right, right. You know, we could yeah. do this like that. Yeah, that's why I said magical strings. <laughs> You're being sarcastic. <laughs> oh, absolutely, yeah. Right. Yeah, because I, you know, as soon as I opened my mouth and said, you know, I want to be infantry. Oh, well, yeah. Let me let me see what I could do, Manny Mo. You know what? Right. Within f within five seconds, you know what? You owe me. You, as a matter of fact, go to the store and get me a sandwich. I got your magic bullet. I got you. I got what you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's, that's the way it goes. Right. So, so yeah, after that, um, you know, I uh, obviously I went through the boot camp and you know, I became a Marine. Now you go to your secondary school where an infantryman is not just an infantryman, it's actually broken up in four, dif four different sections. You know, you have your basic infantryman. He's the one that carries the, uh, the M16 and maybe some grenades and whatnot, uh, or even, uh, extra ammo. And then you got your, uh, uh, machine gunner. Uh, this could e be either your, um, M249 or M240. Uh, and that's, uh, two different types of machine guns. Um, can you, can you explain the difference in those, uh, two weapons? Okay. The M249 saw, as it's called, it's, um, Shoots a five five six round on a belt. Um, usually, there's I want to say a two hundred to a hundred round drum for them. On top of that, you can feed it magazines. It's versatile. However, it does jam. And <laughs> and and the reason why they, they call it they call it the the saw. It's the acronym for squad automatic weapon. And a lot of individuals would describe the 249 <laughs> saw as the as an M16 on steroids, correct? Oh, absolutely, man. It's called the well, the the, the acronym, you know, gives it its name, you know, because I, so many rounds go through that thing that yeah, you can shop sh stuff, you know, pretty free easily, and, pretty easily. But, uh, Mm -hmm. And then you have the 240 Golf, which shoots a 7.62, correct? Yeah, so it's a bigger caliber uh, machine gun, you know, so it's going to create a lot more damage. Now, before we move on, when I'm, I'm going to be jumping a little bit back and forth, but as we're talking about uh, machine gun weapon systems, <laughs> us being, uh, bless you, <laughs> bless you, us being in, in the Marine Corps when we were in uh, Iraq, both OFI 1 and 2, the Marine Corps, we would carry 240 Gulfs or a 50 caliber machine gun, or you would see a, a Mark 19, which was a machine gun that shot 40 millimeter grenades. But do you recall, Manny, when we were in Iraq, we would see army units and the majority of the army units on a turret of a Humvee or even a, a five ton truck, they would have, they would have uh, saws. They would have two forty nines. It didn't make sense to me. Yeah. It didn't make, it didn't make sense to me. I, the way I looked at it is the Marine Corps. We had less funds. We had less money, but the, the army had all this huge funding. So why would you put a less, <laughs> A less caliber gun on a turret. A turret should be a a format, a placement for a higher caliber, more heavy duty to medium machine gun weaponry. Did did that make sense to you when you saw the army carrying two forty nine saws on their turrets? 
from a tactical point of view, the only sense that it makes is, uh, you know, you can reach fire superiority because you're shooting a lot more rounds. Mm -hmm. However, you know, that's only good for certain types of targets. Right. When it comes to medium armored vehicles, you're not going to do, I mean, that's, Ladies and gentlemen, a 249 saw is utilized. It's a machine gun that you would go on a foot patrol with. Yeah, it's more for personnel. Yeah, it's more more for personnel assault uh, instead of uh, mechanized or vehicle motor transport assault. And it didn't make sense to me. And that's what made me realize the Army... It, it, and the only reason why I'm saying this is because every vehicle that we saw had a 249 saw, and we were carrying. I, I know I was I was manning uh, even as a sergeant. Uh, I was a machine gunner and a uh, and a squad leader, but I was manning a, a 240 Golf, which shot a 7.62. Uh, but every vehicle that we saw in Iraq was you know had the 249. So it didn't make sense to me. Well, um. Hell, who knows what what their uh, thinking is on that one, you know? Right. So you end up getting out of boot camp. You go to SOI. Can you give us the, the acronym for SOI? SOI, School of Infantry. Well, when you go to the School of Infantry, you know, we talk about the, the different um, types of uh, uh, infantrymen. So then you get designated. Once you go to the the basic infantryman portion, then you get to uh, well, it's kind of like the boat spaces, you know. Right. Um, yeah. So they choose the other MOSs for you. So there's uh, your mortarman, your assaultman, your machine gunner. Right. <laughs> which I was an assault man, um, to start that, uh, 0351. Yeah. Let me, uh, let, let me, let me read out this certificate real quick. If you would allow me, brother. Yeah, go ahead, bro. It says infantry training battalion takes pleasure in presenting this certificate to Manuel E. Molina certifying that he has met all requirements and has successfully completed the curriculum prescribed by the commandant of the Marine Corps anti-tank assault men given at the school of infantry marine corps base camp pendleton california the first day of may 1998 jr willis lieutenant colonel usmc so you are an anti-tank assault man. yes sir sounds badass sounds hella badass can you tell the listeners what that job title entails what is your job an anti-tank assault man right um we get different types of trainings with explosives rocket launchers um if you guys ever seen uh you know um private ryan uh it, back in those days uh 0351 or an anti-tank assault man was the uh the um the person carrying that uh, flamethrower hmm. or the Bangalore torpedoes, which we still use to this day, the, um, you know, it's just an explosive that's in a linear form, and, uh, like a, a tube, and you attach multiple tubes together um, and you push them through a line or a minefield that you want to, uh, you know, go through. So once it blow detonates, it's gonna clear that wire or or um, mines that that are in that uh, that path. It's like a line charge, correct? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But uh, you know, Bangalore torpedo is more of a smaller uh, type of device. Now, yeah. moving forward to modern day infantry assault men or tank assault men, that would also bring your arsenal. Um, Equipment uh, with the AT4 uh, rocket launcher, correct? Well, the, the AT4 rocket launcher, um, 
actually replaced what was called the law. I and, recall uh, the law, yes, back uh, in the 80s. In right, the, yeah. Vietnam, no, um, the re- uh, one of the reasons the 84 kind of took over is, um, you know, it's a bigger warhead, obviously. You know, it's a, I think it's an 83 millimeter uh, rocket. And also, the um, well, the, the 84 is, is not just for assault men, it's for basic infantry basic, men. Basic infantry, mm-hmm. Yeah, which, you know, everybody, you know, like you were saying, you know, you go into the Marines, everybody's going to be an O three hundred 300 because you're going to be qualifying with that rifle. Right. Um, yeah, and then all these designators that come afterwards, which is your O three eleven. As somebody that's been through the actual training of being that infantry man, right? You know, um, O three forty one is your uh, um, mortar man, and O three thirty one is your machine gunner. Uh, and the machine gunners, obviously, like you, you did. Um, you know, you learn all the different machine guns, beginning with the M two forty nine saw, saw uh, two forty go, yeah, then fifty caliber 40. machine gun. Uh, and 40 you're a Mark Mike, 19. Mike. Exactly. Yes, Mark sir. 19, that's correct. Mm-hmm. So, you, so you go ahead and um, you transition, you you graduate from School of Infantry. Uh, tell us about <clears throat> where you were uh, when 9-11 happened. Okay, my, my first duty station just so happened to be Hawaii. And, uh, that's where I was. I was in Hawaii, uh, in my barracks, sleeping, and I got a phone call, uh, from one of my local friends. And, uh, she's like, Manny, do you know what the fuck is going on? You know, and turn on the TV. And sure enough, you know, I think this was before the second plane hit. Hit, correct. Yeah, so, you know, here we are watching this stuff on the news, and, you know, she knows I'm part of the military. She's like, oh, shit, you know, you guys are fucking, what's going on, you know, you you know, like expecting something to happen already, you know, like, are you guys being mobilized? But, uh, yeah, that didn't happen until later. Yeah, when 9-11 happened, for me, I was... uh... My duty station was Okinawa, Japan. I was with 3rd Marine Division. And I recall we were all in the barracks. And there is a, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, there's a common area inside the barracks where they have a <clears throat> a huge TV. They have a pool table, <clears throat> soda machine. <clears throat> and that's where the duty NCO stands their post. It's almost like a fire watch. And, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> my good friend uh, Ramos and I had just came back from Ganville. <coughs> and we see everyone crawling around and standing around the uh, the TV. And then we walk up and we see the first tower in flames. And then maybe six, seven minutes minutes later, we see the second <coughs> the second airplane hit the second tower. And I'm from New York, and my buddy Ramos is from Yonkers, New York. And we immediately go to our rooms and we attempt to call home, you know, just to see, hey, you know, how's the family doing? Do we have any friends that are out there around the immediate Manhattan area? And we can't get a, a, a line through because all the lines are busy. And then shortly thereafter, I would say maybe within the next 30 to 45 minutes, we get a, we get a pass down from the duty non-commissioned officer that we need to start getting our gear packed uh, just in case we get called up. And here we are, 3rd Marine Division, Okinawa, Japan, and we, we're putting our, our gear together. Nonetheless, nothing happened until probably... Uh, you know, a year and a half, two years later. But I recall that evening, and uh, I, I was in disbelief. I was in disbelief. I was like, "What? What the hell is going on? This is crazy." Well, 
especially you being in Okinawa, you'll be like one of the first ones to be in the theater. Right. Nonetheless, we 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 got our gear ready. We never received the call. Uh, I ended up getting orders to go to come to Camp Pendleton in uh, 2001, and it wasn't until 2003 that you and I meet for the first time. Now, <clears throat> before we go into that uh, that bridge that connects you and I, the way you and I met <clears throat> were through this this training company called combat service training or combat skills training. Should I say, how did you get into that position? Uh, Gunnery Sergeant Molina of, of training Marines, uh, to become, you know, assault men, machine gunners, uh, squad leaders, mortar men. Uh, how did you go from SOI and, and, and transition into, training Marines to become infantry? All right. So, uh, you know, I, as I scaled the ladder of rank, you know, by doing uh, pretty much everything that you're supposed to, you know, run your good PFT, uh, physical training tests, um, you know, scoring good on, on tests and whatnot, and actually being knowledgeable of your job, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, winning boards. So can, I, I can I, you can you explain to people what winning boards is because they they're going to be clueless. Okay, a board is pretty much an evaluation of certain Marines. So um, those Marines get nominated by um, their their platoon. Okay, or their their team or, or squad their, or their command. So mm -hmm. it, starts at, it starts at the small unit level. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then once they get selected, they go and compete with all the other Marines that were selected as well, and they go up to what is called a board. <laughs> a board is kind of like a a panel that is going to evaluate uh, the different Marines in their appearance, um, you know, because they do have to dress in certain uh, certain uniforms or the uniform that, that is... Um, designated for that board? Right, requested at the time right. you know, for that board. So, you know, if it... Um, <clears throat> let's say an off, off a uniform, and, you know... Candidate number one is excellent, you know, with his knowledge and everything else, but his ribbons were all jacked up or out of order or something, you know, because there's Marines always look at the details. That's correct. You know, and they train, they train you to do this, you know, uh, from boot camp, you know, it's like Irish Bennett. All right, you know, you can't have any of those. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Irish penance is when you have a thread, a thread that is just dangling off your uniform. You cannot have any threads of nylon hanging. Those, that's what is Irish pennant. And what uh, Gunnery Sergeant Molina is saying, they also inspect you on your uniform. Uh, they make sure that your um, your trousers are properly pressed. As a matter of fact, they put you in a position what's called parade rest, where you have your hands to your back, small of your back, and then you have both of your feet spread. And what they're looking for is to see if there's any wrinkles within the inseam of the trouser. Um, Not only that, I mean, the, the, the trousers themselves can only be... Um, so high off the sole of the, the shoe. That's correct. Oh, and, wow. and then the alpha blouse belt can only be three to four inches in length. It's funny because yeah. there, there was a, there was a, a movie that I just saw just several days ago where there was an individual playing a Marine and his alpha blouse belt went all the way to the small of his back like almost <laughs> to the smallest of his back. And I was like, who the hell did they get to represent um, 
as a Marine Corps representative for, you know, to give details for this guy's uniform, man, that is unsaid. Um, so yeah. So, you know, I, I, I'm sorry. what I've heard about this, mm-hmm. um, is that that's, that's the way that Hollywood can portray, um, Marines is by, if you ever notice, most of the uniforms that are worn, there's something always off, off. with that uniform. Right. Yeah. It's funny because I'll see something extremely awful. Um, like there will be an alpha blouse, which is in, ladies and gentlemen, it's a olive a green colored coat. And then they'll have, uh, <laughs> they'll have <clears throat> blue Marine Corps blue chevrons, which is a red and gold uh, chevron on that green. Uh, and, and you're not, that's incorrect. It's, it's, it's a, a olive and red chevron that's supposed to be on that uniform. But, you know, nonetheless, man, we're not perfect. Your mind isn't always there. So when you go to these boards, Ladies and gentlemen, you you have to be on your P's and Q's. So tell us about the knowledge portion of of those boards. What type of questions do they ask you? Well, um, you know, they're going to ask you about history. They're going to ask you about uh, your your particular um, military occupation. Um, They're going to ask you about some general stuff, which uh, pertains to... uh, um, the um, military code of, of justice. That's well, correct. That's correct. Uh, were you going to ask you about, about the different Marine Corps orders? That's so, correct. Uh, Papa 34, Tank Foxtrot. <clears throat> They're going to ask you I about know. proper proper placement of chevrons. Uh, yeah. Listen, bisecting the collar, bisecting the angle. Listen, I, I was a board marine. It's been a while, but I'm kind of close. <clears throat> it's all right. Listen, I was a board marine. I was, I was a. <clears throat> excuse me, I was a PFC for seven months, and I was a lance corporal for four months. Sorry. Yeah, Lance Corporal for four months. There were a lot of jealous Marines in uh, Third Marine Division. Four months, I was a Lance Corporal. That is unheard of. Uh, but I, but, but I, my knowledge was great. Uh, what's the if mission? You want, you, want the, you want one of them boards, huh? Listen, uh, what's the mission of the Marine Corps Rifle Squad? To locate, close with, and destroy the enemy by fire maneuvering to repel the enemy's assault by fire in close combat. What are the three parts? Correct. What are the three parts of a grenade? The body fuse filler. Uh, what is the proper placement placement of a chevron? Half an inch centered, bisecting the angle. Uh, believe me, man. I I had it all down, locked and cocked. Uh, the five organic weapons. The purpose for close order drill. Uh, the quatrefoil. Uh, believe me. It, it, they answered it. I spit it out, and I owe it all to this individual called Sergeant Brady, who sped. Um, he 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 spoon fed me all this knowledge. Uh, so yeah, I was I I don't know how many times I I won uh, Marine of the Quarter, non commissioned officer of the quarter. Uh, but it was all knowledge based, and but it was because of the help of. Uh, you know, a sergeant who who looked at me he was like, "All right, man. You know, this guy he's gonna be okay." And he and he, you know, he gave me all this knowledge. So, you, honestly, uh, not to not to cut you off, but um, uh, you know, I I feel a little pride in myself um, because, like that sergeant, you know, that was spoon feeding you this knowledge. Um, I went to corporal's course. Mm. And in corporal scores, you learn, you know, how to become an NCO. And yes, you're you're going to be learning, you know, a lot more knowledge as well. Um, not only, uh, you know, his historical wise, but also, you know, like in drill and. And all this other stuff that you use on the on the day to day. You you know what and, I you know what I enjoyed about course corporal's course was that 
it taught me uh, the the manual of of handling a sword to present okay, sword. That's correct. That's correct. How to march a platoon in an effective, correct okay, manner. You know, the, the flags and and the blacks and all that good stuff went to college so that it can be properly executed. All, all that good. Stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. So you know, um, me, I absorbed all that. Oh I, well, as a corporal, you know, it's like you're you're just getting your 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 feet wet at that time. You know what I mean? So it's like for me, I, I can say that I made a difference um, because as we speak, there is a first sergeant drill instructor who remembers me walking the fucking halls and waking his ass up to fucking clean my my deck. You know what I mean? It's <laughs> deck. Yes. You know, you know what I'm saying? Yes. So, so, so I did my job. That's correct. <laughs> now now he, he he's he's got a bigger picture, you know, he's training hundreds of, of, of uh, men to become Marine. So, yes, I'm, I'm proud that he's accomplished and he has surpassed me in something that, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't do. You you helped mold him to become a great leader. That is awesome. In, in, a, in a way, you know, I, I stuck with him because he wasn't really, <clears throat> he wasn't really one of mine. You know what I mean? Right. I, I yeah, but, but he personally came to me and he told me this. And I was like, what? Are you serious? Right. I was like, okay, I, I didn't see myself in that in that way, but thanks, you, you know? You don't know the impact that, that you have on people. And it's particularly gratifying when you have a Marine uh, that's under your command that is all of a sudden getting promoted and he calls you up to pin his new ranks, chevrons, on his collar. That's very, Absolutely. very, very gratifying. Very gratifying. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sign of respect. It's a sign of, of appreciation. Appreciation, yes. You know. So, Gunnery Sergeant Molina, so how did you get into the uh, training uh, uh, CST, the the, the uh, combat skills training uh, company. Yeah, so uh, you know, I, I wanted to be that badass, right? So um, uh, my four years came up, and well, you know, I, w I was a sergeant at that time, which you know, I, I you know, sergeant in four years is actually pretty good. You know what I'm saying? And that, and that's what I think part of uh, for if you don't meet a certain uh, expectation, you know, to, to build your rank within so many years, then you know the Marine Corps is going to let you go. And I believe for um, sergeant, if you don't make sergeant within uh, eight years, then they they let you go. Or if you don't make corporal within the four years, then the Marine Corps let, lets you go. Yeah, no, you're right. After uh, I believe it's eight years, if you haven't picked up sergeant, the Marine Corps gives you the good stinky boot, uh, and you're gone. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, but pushing forward. So, uh, so how'd you get into yeah, uh, but, to that? So, anyways, I, I was I was saying how I um, you know I want to be special forces and all that, and you know you go and talk to your um, trans transitional recruiter or whatnot because he's the one that's he knows or he's got the information about, you know, what both spaces are where, hmm. you know, so if you wanted to go to, um, Europe or if you wanted to, or if you wanted a particular school, which in this case, that's what I wanted. I wanted jump school, hmm. you know, and, uh, that was, that was my incentive to reenlist. Right. You know, I want to jump school. Well, it, it didn't pan out that way. So, um, uh, combat skills training school was next on the on the poll, and I chose it one because uh, it was going to be at home. 
you know, so my commute to go see my family was going to be short. Um, two, I was, I was going to be in a different status, you know, I'm now an instructor other than doing the everyday training and, mm -hmm. and all of that, you know, so it, it broke up the monotony of just being that infantry God. Wow. So let me give you my side of the story where <clears throat> at the time I was a, I was a diesel mechanic at Camp Pendleton um, over at Del Mar working for at the time, which was a GSM general support maintenance where we were rebuilding engines and transmissions from scratch, from the block, putting in pistons. I mean, it was a great, uh, great learning tool, man. I could have taken that, um, those skill sets into the civilian world and, you know, would have been making well, I, some great money. Absolutely. <clears throat> so what happened was I wasn't uh, <clears throat> particularly fond of uh, getting grease under my fingernails. Uh, I enjoyed the, I enjoyed the job, man. But believe me, uh, having diesel... Um, oh, fumes, fuel, you're always smelling like this. Yeah, having that on your skin and going home smelling like diesel and oil, it, it you know, it kind of, after a while, you get, you know, it gets old. So they start, they were asking for volunteers. Uh, in particular, they were asking for sergeants. And there were several sergeants within my company, as well as some corporals and some non rates. Uh, they were looking for, for these, uh, for these individuals in particular leaders and sergeants to go to this course to become squad leaders and machine gunners or mortar men or uh, heavy machine gunners. <clears throat> and I volunteered along with an individual called uh, Sergeant uh, Romerdred and uh, other individuals, man. We just like, yeah, man, let's, let's go. And, and, and uh, Sergeant Farrow, who was on the podcast not too long ago, we said, yeah, let's go. And uh, we end up going to combat skills training, and that's where I meet you. And uh, to say the least, I learned very, very quickly that there's a saying that um, because of your IQ level, if you don't have a high IQ level, you're going to become infantry. And I learned very probably within the first three days that was untrue. You have to have you have to have uh, a bright mind to be an effective infantryman, squad leader, machine gunner, uh, mortar man, uh, and specifically to call for fire correctly with the correct uh, with the correct coordinates. Very quickly, I was like, holy, I thought it was going to be, well, shit, man, this is going to be, we're just going to go back to boot camp and Marine Corps combat training. And I learned very quickly, you had to know your shit to know the precise beating zone of a machine gun, uh, where, where people don't even know what the beating zone of a machine gun is. Ladies and gentlemen, when you press the trigger, the a machine gun is fully automatic. When you press the trigger of a machine gun, the machine gun has a natural beating zone. So uh, let's imagine it's a it's a it's a circle eight, but it's vertical. It has to do with the trajectory of the round. That's correct. And there's a natural point within the center of that beating zone. That's the sweet spot. And I learned real quick as a machine gunner, you better know where that is because that's going to be your most effective point of fire. I learned fields of fire, trajectory of fire, so there's no fragmentation, so you don't hit your fellow Marine. All these things I learned very, very, uh, not quickly, but I learned very quickly, holy shit, there is a lot of knowledge in order for you to be uh, an infantry marine, uh, specifically a, a squad leader, and specifically a machine gunner, which I was in a squad leader. And um, my hats off to you, gentlemen, uh, who were teaching that school. How was it on on your side of the house teaching what you would consider uh, uh, non 
infantry Marines? Um, well, just, just let me say something before, before I get into that. Uh, you know, we were talking about machine guns in the beating zone. Yeah, the beating zone is that sweet spot because uh, the trajectory of the round, when you shoot it, it kind of arcs. Mm -hmm. The sweet spot is where that round is landing. Landing. However, uh, however, you know, when it comes to machine guns, machine guns are used also like a mortar. So, you know, you kind of, if you can visualize this, you know, you got a hill in between you and the enemy. However, you're able to shoot your round and still be effective because it of the curvature because of, it that, of the, run, that, the trajectory of the round. That's correct. <clears throat> so, yeah, like you were saying, yeah, it, 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 uh, I, I, too, give, you know, mortar men and, and machine gunners props because I never got to that level. I just know about the employment of those particular machine guns. That means, you know, the, the maximum uh, firing Eff range. Effective and, range. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And then how, how do you employ them? Obviously, you want to set them up where the enemy is most likely to approach, approach. you. Approach. That's correct. And then, and then that, ladies and gentlemen, there's such a thing called as uh, talking guns. Yeah, so, so you're in a lot of fields of fire. Right. So... Um, uh, l let me explain talking guns, and um, and then you can you can explain interlocking fields of fire. So, ladies and gentlemen, talking guns is is I have a machine gun, right? Whether it's a two forty nine uh, saw or two forty golf, I have a machine gun. I'm on foot, and let's say I'm to the right, and there's another m marine who's a machine gunner. And let's say he has a 249, or it doesn't matter, but he has a machine gun, but he's probably, uh, let's say he's uh, 30 meters to my left. Now, our job is to suppress the enemy. So what will happen is we'll designate who's going to shoot first. I'll look to the left, he'll shoot first, and he'll, he'll do a, a, a spat, and it'll go. Brrr. The moment he pulls with the trigger... He stops pulling the trigger. I pull my trigger. Brrr. The moment I stop, he pulls. Brrr. So you'll hear this. This is what you'll hear. Brrr. 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 And those are called talking guns. And the reason why you do this is because you want to keep the enemy's heads down. And the reason why you want to keep the enemy heads down is because you have a fire team. And the moment that, that the enemy's head are down your fire team is now rushing and they're called fire team rushes so you have four fire teams within the squad and you'll the first fire team will say okay first fire team ready to rush rush and as i'm shooting the enemy my beating zone has to be precise to keep those enemies heads down so now that first fire team goes now that second fire team may want to do a hook position so now they're trying to outflank the enemy and then that third fire team will continue to go forward. And then we continue to do uh, talking guns until that second fire team can go, can come to their side and outflank them and hit them from the left or the right side. Now that machine gunner to my left also has another four fire teams on his side and they're attempting to do the same thing too. So we overwhelm the enemy by firing close combat. That's what fire t talking guns and fire team Russians are. Now, if you can go ahead and explain interlocking fields of fire are, Manny Mo. Right. Also with the talking guns, um, you know, because one gun is going uh, at a time, if you need it to reload, that other gun can pick up the slack. Yes. So you can, he, he'll actually have to fire at a, at a much higher of rate or a much longer period and for two purposes many more let's not forget sometimes uh you know the the barrels they do get hot and you have to switch out barrels right so it, you know, it allows you to uh buy exactly. barrels as well correct correct so let so go ahead and explain interlocking fields of fire if you will 
So the interactive fields of fire has to do with um, um, creating pretty much like a, a crossfire between your machine guns so that you cover the most space um, that you can, you know, depending on the area that you're covering, of course. Mm. Um, and, you know, like we've talked about, yeah, you want to place, you know, your heavy uh, guns, machine guns, in the enemy's most likely avenue of approach. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, so you, you want to put your big guns where the roads are, and then you want to put your other guns to where... You know the infantryman might might be coming to or whatnot. That, that that's pretty much your your interacting field of, field fire. of fire, and you 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 want to have that if you're covering a perimeter. Let's say um, the perimeter is five fighting holes. Mm. Let's just make it simple. You know, so the five fighting holes are going to be pretty much in kind of a circle or circumference to one another. That way you're able to cover 360. Perfect. And then what I learned from that, that whole evolution of training was uh, foot patrols, formations, hand and arm signals. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, uh, the wedge, echelon left, echelon right, skirmish left, skirmish right. All these different configurations within a fire team, a mass within, you know, a, a platoon or a squad would give you the most effective maximum firepower depending on where the enemy was and, and where you had to face them. It was just a plethora, a plethora of knowledge that had to be consumed in, in, a, in a pretty short amount of time. How long was that course, uh, Gunnery Sergeant? Well, the actual course were uh, like a um, a non-infantry person that was just going through the school was about one to two weeks. Now, uh, you're talking about... That wasn't uh, that wasn't our school, though. We, we went a lot longer. Our school... Oh, because, yeah, our school yes, was... was we were actually, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, we were slotted to go. So yeah. our training was, yeah, a little extended. Mm -hmm. Our training you know, consists. Our, our training consisted of months. But you know the thing about it was, uh, Manny Mo, we had no idea. Maybe you guys knew you were slotted to go, but we didn't know we were slotted to go. Our training was was months, months. And we had no idea. Yeah, because yeah, you guys, you guys used to hold your formations in front, and and uh, and then from there we would begin the day. Right. No, it was it was close. It was like three months that that whole evolution happened, and I, uh, you know maybe you knew as the training uh, portion for the infantry, you gentlemen probably knew, but we were unaware the moment that we graduated and received, we received our certificates. I remember I, I received my certificate for, for a uh, squad leader and machine gunner. And uh, so did, you know, uh, Sergeant Farrell, Sergeant Ramirez. And then we went back to GSM. It was a Friday. I, I will never forget it. They told us, okay, come Monday morning, uh, you're going to report back to that same unit. That's going to be your unit. We're leaving to Iraq. No, yeah, they said, we're leaving to Iraq, but you're going with them. What we need you to do is grab your toolbox, do an inventory, and you're going to give your toolbox to another mechanic, and good luck, Marine. You're going with the infantry. And myself and Sergeant Jafaro looked at each other, and we're like, what? But hold on, man. We only did like three months worth of infantry training where... How long is the school of infantry? What, like six months? No. How long? How long is the school of infantry? Well, I want to say it's about about a month, maybe. Well, shit, man, we did about three months worth of training. So, shit, I, I thought the school of infantry was a lot longer than that. But even after that, you guys still go through specialized no. training, right? Yes. Right. You so, know, yeah, they teach you, you know, the other weapon systems that you're going to be utilizing. You go into the business to actually learn how to shoot and, you know, you know, just feel comfortable with it. You know, the funny thing is, was that um, there was this one time I was telling my, my buddy, man, I was like, yeah, man, I was in Iraq. We were with this infantry unit 
And uh, I looked it up online, man, at the moment, and I, I plugged in uh, S.A. Anderson. You remember uh, Supply Area Anderson? Yeah. And then uh, I read, you know, a, a specialized unit, trained a specialized trained unit of marines was providing security and i was like well shit that was us man <laughs> that was us and we were we were on we were i found us on google and i was like that's really? fucking awesome man i was like holy shit man but nonetheless special, yeah, yeah special no spe specially trained unit which mm. which that was the fact man we did we did about a good three months worth of fucking training um, well, yeah, your, your knowledge as far as protecting yourself definitely uh, w went up a couple degrees, you know what I'm saying? Uh, a couple degrees, man. I think not. I think it went up a hell of a lot of, of levels, man. We were able to, to set claymores, fire AT4s. I mean, what you guys did for us and the... That's my bread and butter, baby. Brother, you guys, you guys taught us a plethora amount of knowledge within a three month mark and no, much much appreciation I it's pretty crazy that i still remember a lot of this stuff because well fuck um yeah i was one of the structures for the uh claimer mine portion and, you know and i can tell you yeah that motherfucker holds 700 bbs and it has a <laughs> one pound one and a half pound of c4 it has one eyelid, and yeah, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I can fucking win that class right now as we speak about it. <laughs> I remember. I, w I was a student in that class. <laughs> but, you know, I have no crawling, but you know what I do. Hey. So listen, so we break, we get our certificates. We go back to GSM. Hey, come Monday morning, you go back to combat service training uh, you're going with those infantry marines. You guys going with the grunts? Like fuck, dude, brother. <laughs> listen, let me tell you something. And you and I'll send you a link. I think I'll I'll send you, you a are link. Now a grunt. That's basically what they told you. Yeah, you guys are now infantry. You guys are now grunts. <laughs> let me tell yep. you how <sighs> we were so myself and my room at the time was Sergeant Farrow. He, he was on a podcast. I interviewed him. And that happened on a Friday evening, man. On a Friday afternoon, that same Friday evening, him and I, we went out to Oceanside and we went to go see, t we went to, to one of the fortune tellers. And we was like, I was like, yo, uh, are we coming back alive, man? Because, yo, what, this, ain't, this is not even our military occupational skill. We're going to fight. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, the lady was like, yeah, no, nah, don't worry about it. You're coming back. And as a matter of fact, in, in about 10 to 11 months, you're going to meet the woman you're going to be with for the, re for the rest of your life. And sure enough, to the fucking month. Um, Get the fuck out of here. Yeah, man. I met, I met Carol. I met my wife. Ain't that some no, crazy no, 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 shit? But the, the fortune teller got it right? Yeah, she got it right, man. February 14th, we got on that plane. I'll never forget it. February 14th, we left uh, March Air Force Base. And uh, sure enough, man, uh, shit, you know, here I am. And I, and I, and it's funny when I, cause when I came back, I started like, I was like I'm, I'm going to tell you like this, the most fucked up part for that whole ordeal wasn't the fact that, um, we were going to war for me, for me. It was the fact that, um, let me see. We, we went to March Air Force Base on a Sunday. That. Friday night, a couple of us CST buddies decided we wanted to go to the the one club where they're on the ocean slime. I, I forget the name of it. Hmm. Um, Margarita anyhow, Rocks. It, it had like a little cellar that, that would take you kind of like downward. Yeah, it doesn't matter. I don't know. Yeah, so anyways, um, you know, we have all our planning, okay, uh, if, if, if we need to come home, we're going to have the duty driver come get us. Okay. <laughs> now, we, we were trying to plan, you know what I'm saying? We were trying right. to plan. Right. Um, uh, you know what? Um, homeboy um, lives around the corner from, from the club that we were going. Mm. So, you know what? We can crash at his pad. You know, good ideas, right? Right. You guys are planning ahead. Yeah. 
except for when you're fucked up, which in my case, that's yeah, you know I get it sometimes. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll go into those stories here later on. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll get there eventually. But uh, so, so anyhow, you know, I, I'm inebriated, and somebody, you know, we're at the bottom of this club, and he says, uh, "I dare you to fucking like, you know, go because they had go-go dancers and stuff." And somehow I ended up being a go-go dancer with my shirt off, and next thing I know. I was getting carried out by a bouncer. I'm talking about. I'm talking about carried out. Like my foot, my feet were completely off the ground, and this guy was telling me, "You know, you pick up pick up kids by the elbow sometimes." Yeah. That's how he grabbed me. So I tucked in my feet, and he carried me all the way up the steps, kicked me the hell out. <laughs> Yeah, so then, so then, uh, you know, we're like, all right, let's go to the dude's house. We go to the dude's house, and we ordered burritos, from, burritos, and all kinds of shit from uh, uh, that one spot right there. On, uh, uh, you know which one I'm talking. Oh, about. Bro, Charles, or one of those spots, yeah. Eddie yeah, Bertos, so, yeah. So, so you know, everybody gets something to eat, and I start getting the. Uh, influence hey come on man let's go let's go come on come on let's go mm-hmm. and uh, yeah so i ended up we ended up leaving and sure enough i got busted i ended up spending the night in jail you got you you got pulled uh, over uh, driving while under the influence yeah yeah well i spent the night in jail i'm there the next day and uh you know, somebody from 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 my unit has to come get me now. Mm. Uh, one, we're getting ready to fucking leave the next day. You know what I mean? So if I would have stayed there any longer, I would have been a deserter. Ooh, shit! No, that's missing a movement, man. That's missing a combat yeah. movement. Holy shit! Right, right, right. So uh, it was Staff Sergeant Dixon. He came and got me, and uh, you know he was kind of understanding. You know, mm. it happened, but still, you know, like, fuck, why did it have to happen? Like, right. you know, we had, we had A, B, and C, except for D, which is me getting behind the wheel. Right. So I fucked up. You know, I fucked up. I should have never done that. You know, no matter. Who tells you, hey, you know, fuck, let's go, blah, 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 whoopie, woo. You know, we were good, we were were. Right. Um, but, yeah, I, I was, you know, drunk, so I I uh, made a wrong decision, which, you know, held me back from uh, actually, um, you know, building myself up faster than, than I did. Yeah. You know, because I did. At the end, you know, I, I still made it to gunnery sergeant in what twelve years. Yeah, no, yeah, <laughs> I understand. So uh, you know, I, I, you know, you have your M- M- Marine Corps um, leadership traits, and I do live by those. You know, know yourself, seek self improvement. Yes. The acronym is JJ Dead Tie Buckle. Judgment. Justice, tact, initiative, enthusiasm. Uh, uh, that a, uh, that about it? It? Dependability, initiative, enthusiasm, bearing on selflessness, courage, knowledge, loyalty, endurance. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Listen, yeah, I do recall the next day, man, because you and I, by that time, we were pretty tight. We were pretty close. And I remember you coming to myself and Romeo Madrid and you and you told us, hey, look, I just caught a DUI last night. And we're like, yo, man, well, fuck it. Did they let you out? Yeah, you're here. Well, shit, man, put that shit behind your back, because, buddy, we are going yeah. to war. We are going yeah, to son, war. We're going to war. Son, we're not aware. We're gonna get into it eventually. But remember, that whole DUI was one of the reasons I kept volunteering to stay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 
<laughs> Yo. I wanted to avoid, avoid it like the plague, and you know what? It, it, it backfired on me. Did it? How? Because the way I see it now is like, you know what? I, I got the DUI, boom. The war's still fresh, boom. You know, I go back, they're going to feel some type of way, and maybe they'll let me off, you know, good. Right. Or easy. But no, I let it linger, and other motherfuckers had already fucked up that whole program to where it's like, oh, we've seen this shit before, you know what? Oh, oh shit. Yo, that's fucked up. I understand your point of view of how you like you kind of wanted to to pull the strings of sympathy. And right, so, right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let me stay out of you and like, you know, let me fight the middle war and all this. And uh no. <laughs> Yo, <laughs> that that's damn, that's fucked up, man. I, I'm sad it didn't work on your behalf, but uh I mean obviously we'll we'll talk about it here uh here moments later, but yeah, there were several Marines that decided to extend and stay. Uh, you were one of them. I was one of them. Sergeant Ramirez was one of them. Lumpy, uh, Lance Corporal Lumpy was one of them. Lance Corporal Rodriguez was another one. And uh, uh, other uh, other several Lance Corporals and Corporals decided to stay back. I decided to, listen, I remember, listen, we were at Camp Viper in Iraq. Uh -huh. And I remember... They came up to me today, Sergeant Lopez. They're looking for volunteers to train to help support another security uh, company, another security platoon up in Al Diwania. For whatever reason, they they needed manpower and uh, they needed training and they needed they needed men. And um, I remember I was sitting. Well, that's there, when we all augmented them, huh? Yeah, I remember. I was I was at like Viper One or Viper Two. It was a listening and observation post, ladies and gentlemen. A listening and an observation post is this. So, if there is an encampment of of Marines, that's like your major body of of Marines or soldiers. So, what happens is they shoot at a three sixty perimeter. They shoot four Marines out three sixty, right? And they give you water, they give you ammunition, they give you food, they give you a two-man tent, they give you night vision goggles, and then you're like three miles out uh, away from the major encampment of the military occupational force. And your job is to, 24 hours a day, you are the fire alarm. That means if enemies are on approach, and if I'm Viper 2, and if I see enemies coming... I, I give out what's called a salute report. That size, activity, location, unit, time, and equipment. I'm supposed to give Before out that. <laughs> I'm supposed to give out that information the moment I see that enemy coming my way. I'm on the radio. Uh, Viper 2, Viper Headquarters, uh, or Viper Headquarters, this is Viper 2. We have blah, 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 blah coming our way. And I always, I always told my Marines, hey, man, if it's a mechanized unit, we are fucked. So run, we can run three fucking miles, motherfucker. If the moment we can spot them, let's bring it out. Let headquarters know, hey, we have mechanized unit coming our way. Grab the M16s and start fucking running towards headquarters because that's where the battle is going to happen. They're just going to fucking run over us like ants. Don't fire. Do not fire. We're running three miles in the fucking desert towards headquarters, and that's where we'll fucking line up for defense, and that's where we'll make our final stand. And if by any chance you hear the mechanized unit coming up on your ankle, you know, shit, do not get captured. So you know what you got to do. But the, nonetheless, I recall they came up to me, and they were like, Sergeant Lopez, they're looking for volunteers to stay. And I remember, and I said, fuck. I just paid off my honda accord in three months with this <laughs> with this hazard pay <laughs> i said yeah i'm going to extend so when our unit when our parent command left in what was it like uh april or may right yeah, yeah. we stayed yeah. we stayed in iraq until the beginning of the beginning of October. We got back in CONUS. Ladies and gentlemen, CONUS is the continental yeah. United States. We got back October 5th. 
of 2003, and I met my I wife. Mean, we didn't just volunteer. We didn't just volunteer one time. We volunteered two times. Yes. Yes. Who wants to stay here till the end? Yes. And there we go. Us, us. The money's beautiful. The money. I mean, we do the 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 paychecks. No, no, no. But by that time, we, we had already uh, had a, our own little group. You know. So yeah, we were tight. Like, we were tight. Okay. We were tight, man. We we, we had we had you, myself, Mc, uh, Sergeant McKinnon, Sergeant Romerdred, uh Rodriguez. Remember Omar Rodriguez who left early? I got a hold of him, by the way. Do you? You got his number? I I, I got him on uh, uh, Messenger or Facebook. Dude, I got to get a hold of that guy, man. Yeah, I got I got him. Uh, I want to say last week I found him. I'm like, what? Wait a minute. Oh Is shit, man! Did? Yo, you know him I and I. Yo, him and I. We 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 got into it, man. For like a like a good thirty seconds, we got into it. Let me tell you. Let me tell you what happened. So oh, I remember. You remember, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, ladies, so so let me explain so the, so the people know, right? So, ladies and gentlemen, we were all sergeants of the guard at this place called uh, Al Diwania. It was a college that us as Marines had had taken over, and and the army was there too. And because we were sergeants of the, of the guards, uh, imagine a three sixty perimeter of l- a listening posts and observation posts of Marines, and those are our Marines. But because we're sergeants. We would split our watch within four hours. So anyways, he went and he checked on his Marines and the the whole perimeter. And then he comes and he wakes me up and it's like two o'clock in the morning. So I get up. The last observation listening post that he checked was the first observation post that I checked. So, you know, Marines are Lance Corporals. They think they're slick. You know what I mean? So, you know, they thought, oh, well, you know, the sergeant of the guard came He's probably the next one's not going to come around till like another, you know, two, three hours. But that was the first fucking post. The last post that he checked was the first post that I checked. And I found those son of a bitches asleep. And I was like, hey, tomorrow morning, come see me. I'm going to thrash your ass. Y'all motherfuckers, was, <laughs> y'all motherfuckers was snoring and scoring. I got you. I said, listen, Marines, you motherfuckers got to keep your eyeballs awake. The enemy is out there. You know, you, the only thing that's stopping the enemy from a, killing us in our sleep are you and his bullshit Constantine wire. And that's not enough. So keep your monkey asses awake. Tomorrow, all four of you guys come see me. I got a good thrashing for your ass. And then I went. Yeah, honestly, because of all of our safeties, yeah. You know, yeah, we used to get some pretty good thrashings, didn't we? Mm-hmm. Well, we used to give them. We didn't receive them. <laughs> but, well, yeah, we're, we're doing our jobs, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, gunny. yeah absolutely. So um, I come back from my, from my four, you know, four hours of, of duty or two hours of duty, and I come back, and for whatever reason, Rodriguez was up. And I said, hey, man. And it, it, and it, was, it was his fire team. And I said, hey, man. I caught your boys asleep. And he goes, bullshit. I say, listen, man, why am I going to lie to you? I got no reason to lie to you. Nah, right, you didn't, yeah, yeah. yeah I, you, you know, nah, you didn't catch them asleep. I said, well, look, man. I said, well, tomorrow I'm going to thrash them. He goes, you can't do that. Those are my Marines. I said, well, listen, man. I caught them. I'm going to discipline them. I said, I'm a sergeant just like you are, right? Yo, those are my Marines, Lopez. First of all, they weren't asleep. I said, okay, listen, I'll tell you what. Tomorrow morning, when they come back and they wake up, why don't you ask them? And if they say, yeah, I'm going to thrash them. And if they say no, I'm going to thrash them anyways. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I caught them asleep. I, I said, what I said, what do you think, man? You think we're here in Iraq and I'm just going to make up lies just to thrash Marines? I, I got better things to do, man. I said, I'm not going to thrash motherfuckers just to thrash them. And then sure enough, man, the next morning I was still asleep. The motherfucker, he tapped me on my shoulder. I woke up and he shook my hand. He goes, hey, man, I'm sorry. He goes, go ahead, do what you got to do. I said, hey, man, we cool, man. We cool. You know, we we take that seriously. Mm Mm-hmm. 
You know what I mean? Well, fuck. I, you know, I used to go out there in the middle of the night, and they knew I was coming. Mm -hmm. so they kept their fucking eyeballs fucking open. <laughs> Yo, your ass used to go, but your ass was crazy. You used to go, you used to go outside the wire. Bro, you used to yes, go I out. Yes, you, I did. you used to go out. You could have got yes, shot. I did. You know what? You could have got shot. Oh, I wasn't. You know, I wasn't even thinking about that. I'm like, fuck. They better challenge me first. <laughs> Who goes there? No, man, no. <laughs> Them dumbass last corporals would have put holes in you, dog. You was I fucking know, crazy, <laughs> man. <laughs> hey. Yeah, but then you're, hey, I was. I was fucking doing that sniper, bro. You know, just <laughs> creeping, creeping on him, finding him up. <laughs> you were being that, v that you were being that Vietcon hey. from Hamburger Hill and shit, man. <laughs> Sometimes I fucking I would, I would creep up on him and just sit there and listen. To him. But they, they would be awake. They would be awake. So I'd just be sitting there listening to this. Oh, is that right? And finally, one of them was back on, and it was like, "Oh shit, there he is!" <laughs> hey man, so let's re let's re hey man. I know I told you the podcast would go uh, an hour thirty minutes, but we're dragging on, man. But if I can still keep you on the line for for a little bit more time, all right, they're gonna resurge, Melina. So I want to read an award that you were given due to to your performance in Iraq, if you would allow me. To Sergeant Manuel E. Molina, United States Marine Corps, for professional achievement and the superior performance of his duties while serving as Sergeant of the Guard for Security Platoon Force Protection in support of Operation Enduring Freedom, Iraqi Freedom. While serving in Kuwait, Sergeant Molina was instrumental in developing and instructing the combat skills training package for all Marines assigned to the security company in preparation for the move across the line of departure. That's the LOD, ladies and gentlemen. Sergeant Molina was responsible for conducting numerous training sessions on weapon systems and explosives, patrolling, radio procedures, calling for effective fire, and EPW handling EPW as enemy prisoner of war, handling procedures to ensure the Marines were tactically proficient. Once combat operations commenced, Sergeant Molina provided security details for convoy and supervised the layout and fortifications of defense positions, ensuring they had interlocking fields of fire and communications. At SA Supply Area Edson, Sergeant Molina's 0311 skills were invaluable. 0311 is what we call it. Can you please uh, give us what the 0311 uh, MOS skill is? The 0311 badass is our rifle, man. He knows, how shoot his he knows how to shoot his M16. He, know how, he knows how to survive. You know, so to shoot that AT4 also, um, although, uh, you know, when it comes to the AT4s, um, all three elevens are able to fire it because um, there's there's only, well, the damn thing has like two or three safeties on it, okay? Mm -hmm. um, but also, um, the main thing is just watching the back blast on that weapon system, and then obviously... Um, in, engaging your target, uh, I think it's uh, accurate up to um, 300 meters and effective at 210. So, however, so the 0311 skill is he's a he's an infantryman, correct? Yeah. So Sergeant Molina's 0311 skills were invaluable, as he had to train rotating personnel, augmentees to be proficient in their newfound duties as security teams. Sergeant Molina conducted numerous day and night dismounted patrols around the camp and throughout the surrounding city in response to hostile enemy fire. He was also in charge of the Guardian Angel security team for VIP 
visits to include, ladies and gentlemen, the Commandant and the Assistant Commandant of the United States Marine Corps. Sergeant Molina's professionalism, initiative, and loyal dedication to duty reflect great credit, credit upon himself and were in high in keeping of the highest traditions of the Marine Corps and the United States Naval Service. Given on this day, first day of September of 2003, Colonel J.J. Pomfret, United States Marine Corps commanding. That sounds pretty badass to me, ladies and gentlemen. Pretty badass. Let's talk about, you know, I want to talk about an incident that happened when we were in Camp Coyote. And we we had a run-in, not a run-in, but we met some of the the British commandos out of Camp Matilda. We, we, we were at a camp in Kuwait called Camp Coyote. Do you recall that? Yes. So when we were BZOing our weapons, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, BZOing meaning uh, when you BZO a weapon, that means that you're trying to get your, suit, your true sight. You're sighting in your weapon. So we were at this particular, it was a, it was like a burn, a burn pit. And, and on one side, there was a, a sand mound and we were just getting our weapons in sight. And uh, there were these British commandos that came and they had an assault rifle and they, they, they called us and they were like, hey, come take a look at this. And they grabbed their machine gun and they put their machine gun to the side. So the port was facing up and they grabbed a bunch of rocks and as one held the trigger and was firing, another another com- British commando let the pebbles go in, into the chamber and the weapon did not, it would not, it would continue to fire. It didn't jam. Do you remember that, Manny? Uh, you know what? I don't think I was there for that one. Man, it, th- that was beautiful. What, what, what weapon system was it? It was, a, it was a British commando weapon. I don't remember what weapon system oh, it was. Okay. So Sand in the chamber and it still went. Huh? It still went. It went in jam. We were like, "Oh man, that's beautiful." But you know what else I, I do recall is um, what I do recall is uh, remember getting off the plane when we hit Kuwait. And ladies and gentlemen, when, when we got on the plane, we had all our weapon systems on us. <clears throat> like not, we didn't have the big weapon systems. I mean, you know, who's going to go into a fucking plane with a fifty cal or a <laughs> Mark nineteen? Uh, but we had M16s, you know, M9 pistols. And I recall as we're getting off the plane, I don't know if, if Molina, if you remember, but um, the stewardess, as we're getting off, the, the, the pilots, they, they came out and they shook every one of our hands and the stewardess were crying. I don't know if you remember that, but it, it I felt like, God damn it, don't fucking cry, man. Don't fucking cry. Because I, I felt like we were going to our death. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I was, shit. I was like, man, don't fucking cry. I was like, I was like, my death is guaranteed now, man. And we were only barely getting into Kuwait. Yeah, man. And, um, you know, I remember when we, we got our orders to march to cross the line of departure. And I believe that was... Uh, the area was uh was called Tampa, right? That was the line of departure, correct? Tampa. Yeah, was it was it? Yeah, I think it was Tampa, right? That sounds familiar. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I remember we didn't sleep. I feel bad for the fucking driver, man, but because because we were in the back of a five ton, and we didn't sleep, and it was fifty fifty, and then all we saw right. were were smoking See, tanks. Being in back of the five ton, you know what? The only the only thing that I that woke me up and uh, let me know that hey, hello, you're at war now. Was the scuds going over their heads at that particular time when we had just gotten there, you know, to the staging area, and they had the uh, scud missile pit on uh, on our left side of where we had staged our vehicles, and I remember. When the, all the light went up in the air, you know, and it was up in the sky, everybody and their mother ran for those uh, um, pits. Pits, yeah. You know, and uh, so we get to the pits, and then uh, there's a couple motherfuckers that 
don't even have their gas masks. Right. You know, and, and it was like, what do you want me to do about it? You know, I got my shit. You know, right. <laughs> La- ladies, ladies and gentlemen, let me let me attempt to paint a picture. We we had moved north from Kuwait into Iraq, and the the trail of us moving was probably well over 24 hours. Probably the first pit stop that we were able to take everyone, the vehicles got into what's called a harem bone formation. So that means the first vehicle in front of you goes to the left, the second vehicle goes to the right, and everyone got out, and the first thing that they did was uh, we had these ammunition cans. They're made of wood. And we start making these little cat holes in the sand. And there's Marines to your left. And there's Marines to your right. And everyone starts taking a shit. <laughs> because you've been, you've been holding this shit for over fucking 24 hours. And everyone, I mean, no one has. No, listen, first of all, when you go to Marine Corps boot camp, you take a shit in front of yourselves anyway. So this right here wasn't nothing new. I remember seeing some fucking gunnery sergeant with a toilet seat attached to his Alice pack. And I was like, look at this fucking dumb shit. <laughs> <laughs> Little did I know this motherfucker probably had a combat action ribbon and had already been deployed to somewhere and, 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 and motherfucking Granada, Grenada or, or Panama or, you know what I mean? But this fucking, this motherfucker was a salty devil dog and had some experience and he knew that those <laughs> yes that motherfucker was prepared and as soon as we got out uh, off the fucking trucks everyone went to go take a shit and and you know some of the marines were providing uh security and then and motherfuckers like yo hurry up man i gotta take a shit too and you quickly realize the Marine with baby wipes, baby powder, uh, shampoo, and deodorant was God. That motherfucker could get any MRE that he wanted just by saying, okay, I'll give you, I'll give you four baby wipes for that fucking uh, spaghetti and, you know, meat sauce fucking MRE. They were fucking Honestly, God. you know, um, well... I had already had experience uh, with dealing with uh, Marines that had habit, you know, like Copenhagen. Mm. Uh, uh, so, yeah, you, you we're, can... We're going to get into that, too. We're going to get into that. How we... No, because, go ahead. Well, no, shit, I'm, I'm bringing it up now because, you know, I, I, I've i been on ship, and mm. that's what happens on ship. And ship is not that long. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You're, uh, at the most, it's going to be 30 days or m- maybe 60. Mm-hmm. But people really, uh, people run out of their product, mm-hmm. you know, and that, you know, I commend. You know, do, um, do, do, Copenhagen, do, what, absolutely. $5 in the thing? Yeah. Nope. Yeah, absolutely. 20 bucks on there. Yeah, absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, we were convoy security, uh, uh, force protection. So part of our job was to provide security for these provisioned vehicles. And these vehicles, whether they had food, water, gasoline, uh, whatever have you, we would be the unit in the front, in the middle, and in the rear, whether it was a 240 Golf or a 50 Cal. So we had capacity of going north and south of, of the battle zone. This is, uh, so, this is before... Before IEDs were implemented, the theater because, um, yeah, we didn't have no uh, armored vehicles. Mm-hmm. We rolled with our weapons pointed outboard. Yes, just 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 to let let the peeps know where you know where we're at. Right. This was this was two thousand three. This is this is March. March, April of 2003, ladies and gentlemen. This is way before the IEDs, even the daisy chain tactics even came into effect. But you remember, you and I and Ramirez came up with a plan where we were, we were at S.A. Anderson, and we decided to put our money together, and we took a convoy from S.A. Anderson back down to Camp Viper to the Mobile PX, and we probably bought... Uh, two hundred and fifty dollars worth of tobacco, 
smoking and chewing, and we brought it up uh, to S.A. Anderson, and we made a killing. You recall? <laughs> Dude, I, I, well, well, you know, because of our liberty of uh, being able to uh, move from Iraq and Kuwait and, and stuff like that, um, we were able to acquire... Um, mm -hmm. You know, certain things that were a commodity for uh, our troops back in the uh, in the rear, including including liquor. <laughs> yes, sir. Absolutely, in including liquor, man. So we 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 quickly became uh, the underground network. Let's go back to uh, the to the first night of the Scud attacks, man. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have been driving up north. For over 24 hours into Iraq, to the left and to the right of us, there's just there's blown up fucking tanks. The tanks ahead of us are fucking doing massive damage. There's fucking bodies smoking on tanks. We finally get out. We take a dump. We take a shit, and then we come to uh, a stopping point. And within this stopping point, I mean, it's massive, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, when the convoy was was moving north, you could not see. You could not see. The if you look to the front, all you could see is brake lights. If you look to the rear, all you could see is headlights. You could not see where that convoy stopped and where that convoy ended. It was that massive. It was huge. Yes, uh, Operation uh, Rolling Thunder. Damn, all was, that fucking dust. Yes, it was fucking huge, and yeah. you felt. You know the only. The only story that I got out of there was uh, Staff Sergeant Allen. Um, because of the um, cloud of dust, his driver ended up running into another vehicle to where um, the engine was pretty much on his lap, and the driver died, by the way. Oh, no shit. This motherfucker was evac right? Went to the hospital, or sitting at the hospital, and he says... Fuck no. I'm a fucking Marine, and I'm a grunt, and I need to be out there with my troops. And you know what? Damn. Damn. I will fucking bow down to this motherfucker, because you know what he did? Mm. He started making his way towards us. How? Hitchhiking, catching planes. Eventually, he made it. Wow. Well, against Marine Corps policy, though. Mm. What are they going to say, though? You know what I'm saying? Like, mm. fuck. Yeah. He did it. That's a true motherfucking war horse right there for your ass, man. Oh, yeah. A true, oh, yeah. That's a, a word. A true, word. A true fucking leatherneck for your fucking ass right there. A true Marine. Hitchhiked, yeah. his, hitchhiked his way back to combat. Oh, yeah. How you like that? Staff like Sergeant that? Allen. You know Staff Sergeant Allen. He was there at the school with him. Absolutely. How you like that? Listen, so we're there... And then we, 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 we set in this massive convoy. We have to provide security for a certain sector of that convoy. And that night, the Scud missiles begin. The Scud missiles start launching from Iraq. We're in Iraq. Keep this in mind, ladies and gentlemen. But apparently, their intelligence was hours, way hours behind. The first Scud missiles start hitting Kuwait. So a couple of missiles hit some of the, the points, uh, the camps that, that were in Kuwait. I don't know if any uh, massive casualties were, were caused because of it. And then they started getting closer, but their intelligence was way off. And every time you would attempt to go to sleep, maybe 20 minutes would pass, and then another two or three Scud missiles would be launched. So then, you know, you would have to run into this big pit, so for the whole evening, every 20 to 30 to 35 minutes, you would have to get up and run. You got no, we got no sleep that night. And then uh, from the south, you would see. I stayed in the pit. Yeah. So from the south, you would see another, you would see afterburners of, of the Patriot missile. And in, in the top 12 o'clock position, you would see this big explosion of like light starburst. And it was the Patriot missile hitting the Scud missile. And motherfucking Marines would go fucking bananas and go crazy. And, and 
we were exhausted, but knowing that the Patriot missiles were hitting these Scud missiles and you could see the explosion, it gave us an adrenaline rush. And um, the very, I mean, the, the, the battery of Scud missiles happened uh, well into the afternoon of the next day where uh, I had a corporal in my fire team and him and I were underneath a five ton because it was so hot. We were trying to get some shade and then we, we just see Marines running, but no, <laughs> nobody's saying nothing. So him and I, we grab our M16s and, you know, we just we just start running along. We're like, well, shit, everyone's running. But nobody's saying shit. And we're not asking anybody hey, what's going on, you know? And we just start running. And then he goes to a Marine, hey, man, <clears throat> why are we running? <laughs> and then he goes, fucking another scud attack. And then we look up, and even in the light of day, in the blue sky, you could see, you could see the afterburner burst of a scud missile. And I remember that particular day, it was hot as fuck. We're in these charcoal green suits. I don't know why. Who the fuck was the logistic officer that decides to give Marines in Iraq in a desert environment green woodland fucking camouflage? Uh, uh, well, wait a minute. NBC I was suits. The only fucking asshole that was wearing the, the fucking desert shit. Listen. I was the only asshole wearing desert shirt. Uh, you know what? I was a fucking target the whole time I was out there. <laughs> this guy knows what the fuck's going on. Kill him. <laughs> Listen. So I remember oh, we're getting we're getting so the whole night we've been we get we've been getting scud attacked onto the the mid morning of the next day. It's like 12 o'clock in the afternoon. It's hot as fuck. We're in the middle of the Iraqi desert. And then these Scud missiles are coming in. And we're fucking running. We put, I put my gas mask on. And to the front of me, I see, I see my, my buddy. I'm thinking to myself, man, I'm going to fucking die amongst a bunch of stinky ass Marines. I'm like, fuck, dude. This is the way I'm going to go out, man. Fuck. And, um, well, it, 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 you know, we didn't die. And then we, we got in our unit. We got in our vehicles. We kept pushing forth. We kept pushing north. We got, we got to Camp Viper. Camp Viper, we, 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 we came in contact with one of the most prolific sandstorms that happened in Iraq within the last 50 fucking years. You remember that shit? Yep, mine also was a fucking clog the fuck up. Ears were clogged up. Eyeballs were clogged up. And do you, know, you and do you and, black balls, all our machinery was all fucked up. And do you, and do you recall in the middle of that there was supposed to be a mechanized unit that was coming our way to attack us? You remember that? Well, absolutely, man. Everybody was, you know, we got everybody on the pro and shit, just anticipating the shit to fucking. Happened, but you know what? At the end of the day, yeah, we would have been fucked. Uh, we had a, we had a couple eighty four scattered around, but still, you know, because that that was one of the main things, you know. Hey, eighty four here, eighty four there, eighty four there. You know what I'm saying? And, and that was that. Everybody lay lay down on the prone and, and and wait for the 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 shit to come at us. I'm gonna tell you something, man. Then we then we went into an area. Uh, called S.A. Anderson. And S.A. Anderson is, is when we encountered our first enemy prisoners of war. S.A. Anderson, there were bodies that were buried within a, within a berm where Iraqi fatalities were pretty much bulldozered in. And uh, sev several days after that, we, the funk was pretty pungent where we started to investigate and we started to find bandoliers, Iraqi gas masks, some old ass fucking muskets and a couple of hands and legs sticking out of this fucking big ass fucking uh, mound. And um, I'd say maybe three, four day, days later after that, there was a, a group of Iraqi families that were marching down that highway that we were protecting, asking uh, they were asking if they could uh, retreat their family's bodies. You remember that? I didn't know something like that. Yes. The bodies that they wanted to, re to retrieve were in that fucking berm. 
And then the E. You, do you recall us uh, uh, grabbing EPWs and putting them in, in within the Constantine wire and feeding them, uh, <laughs> feeding them canned beans? You remember that? Oh yeah, that shit was crazy. Yeah, I remember. That was, that, was, that was one of our main responsibilities was to uh, be uh, guard dogs for the prisoners and enemy prisoners of war. Yeah, you know, it, it's fucked up. Uh, I, I will say that it's fucked up. Well, some of the guys that were in there, they were just innocent motherfuckers. Wrong mm-hmm. place, wrong time. Mm-hmm. Other motherfuckers were in there because, yeah, they actually um, contributed, contributed to um, or acted upon, you know, killing uh, military troops. Yeah. Would be uh, uh, shooting at us with rifles, or, or, or even more. Yeah, man. Yeah. Uh, you, you know what's funny is that when I was talking to um, to Farrell, Sergeant Farrell, man, you, there was a water point, and at that water point, a couple a couple of bodies ended up getting dragged out out of that water sector. It was like a pond. I don't know if you remember, but it, within that pond, we ended up um, swimming in that shit. Do you remember? It, yep. was, it wasn't too far from where our, our camp location was, man, but a couple of bodies ended up getting fucking pulled out of there. Yeah, Let, I nobody ever wanted to go down all the way down to the bottom. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure there were some bodies, uh, some Iraqi casualties in that shit. Um, it's funny, too, man, because uh, one of my Marines inside my, my fire team was uh, Lance Corporal Simpson, and him and I, we we had the, the watch at uh, two o'clock in the morning and I had my NVGs on my night vision goggles and he starts and we, we start, um, going past the berm where all these Iraqi ba- uh, bodies or, uh, enemy combatants who are dead are, are covered. And he starts to ask me, Hey, Sergeant Lopez, uh, Hey, you, do you believe in ghosts? And I'm like, Hey man, don't fuck. It's two o'clock in the morning. And it's, and it's fucking there's like there has to be sixty dead bodies in that fucking berm. Don't hey, fucking yeah. don't. All right, guys, we're gonna leave chapter fifty, the first part of this interview. We're gonna leave it off right here. We will be back soon, so you guys can listen to the second part of this interview with Gunnery Sergeant Manny Manuel Molina. Thank you guys for listening once again. This is DJ Architect. Love you guys. The chapter of the Architect, chapter fifty. DJ Architect out. DJ Architect. Art.